Uh, so today we're going to go a little further uh, in that and, and see how that applies uh, in this text, but also in our lives. So 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1 uh, through 6, and it reads, uh, Now there was a famine in the days of David, for three years, year after year, which means in successive years. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king, David, called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, the children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, we will have no silver or gold. You can't pay us off. We won't take any money from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So King David, he said, whatever you say, I will do. Then they answered the king, as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel. Let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah, Saul's hometown, whom the Lord chose. Oh, and the king said, King David, I will give them. This is an obscure passage of scripture, and if uh, we had not heard or had this one particular passage of scripture in the Bible, we would know that Saul had done this treacherous act. We would know that Saul had actually at one point in his administration sought to annihilate a race of people. And it's interesting because the effect of what Saul did didn't happen during his reign, but later it happened in David's reign. Right now, we're actually living in some challenging times. And uh, throughout the land, I'm not sure if you, we've gone through the holiday season and uh, through Thanksgiving, and most of us ate pretty good. Some of us had some food left over for a few days. But many people all over this country, actually statistics say over 50 million Americans are having challenges feeding their families every week. This being the greatest nation on earth, but there are over 50 million people who didn't have enough food to feed their families. This past uh, week, actually through, during the Thanksgiving season, uh, we and many other food banks gave out hundreds and thousands of bags of food and supplies for families. But uh, many still, even now, after that week is gone, still having challenges with food. And that's what happened here in David's time uh, when he reigned. And we don't know, the Bible doesn't say what year of his reign it was, but at some point during his reign, uh, there was a famine for three consecutive years. We're now in the middle of a pandemic for seven or eight consecutive months. What would it be like if it was this way for three consecutive years? Year after year. What if next year we got another pandemic? A different one. Because they think they got the, the cure for this one. But what if another one hit next year and you don't, you don't even want me to start talking about that. I, see, I feel the fear already. Like, no, don't even say that. Oh, the year after, there was another one. This is what happened in David's time. There was a famine. And through natural eyes, 
They saw the problem, but they didn't see that the cause of the problem was a spiritual condition. It wasn't a lack of rain that caused the famine. It was a lack of compassion and commitment that saw head to the covenant that they had made that caused the problem. And so now they, they are going through a challenge. And if we don't see, see, if David couldn't see with spiritual eyes, he wouldn't have understood what was happening. Sometimes there are problems that look ordinary. They look natural. They, they look like, you know, something's naturally happened. But sometimes there's some spiritual issues behind the natural problem. And David had to get a revelation about what the problem was. Everybody say there's a problem. There's a problem right now but in our country, but something we're trying to figure out. They think we can get a natural solution to it, but we don't know what causes the problems. There's a famine right now, but is the famine the cause simply of the pandemic? What's causing the famine? There's a famine right now in some of our lives personally. There's a famine right now, not just, I'm talking about, not about food, but maybe there's a famine of love in your life. Maybe there's a, a famine of joy and peace in your life. There's a famine in some of our lives where we have to under, recognize what is causing the famine. And in this particular text, we see that Paul, I mean, Saul didn't understand why or the full ramifications of what his actions were going to impact the nation. Sometimes we think, that whatever I do is just about me. And we don't know why. The, the Bible does not tell us why Saul sought to kill these people. The Gibeonites, if you read in uh, Joshua chapter 9, they were a group of people uh, who, when Joshua and the children of Israel began to come over and take over uh, the Canaan land, take over Jericho and Ai, the Gibeonites saw Jericho get wiped out and everybody get killed. And then they saw Ai, and they saw everybody get killed in Ai. And the Gibeonites said, wait a minute, we ain't going to go out like that. We, we, we have to make up another plan. So they disguised themselves and went to the children of Israel and said, hey, we came from a far country. We want you to protect us. Don't, don't kill us. We heard about y'all. And eventually the Israelites made a covenant with them that they would protect them, that they wouldn't kill them, but they would make them woodcutters and water carriers in their land so they would be subservient to them. And catch this, after the children of Israel get delivered from Egypt, now 40 years later, they're oppressing somebody else. We have, to, we have to be careful about when God sets you free, who you put in captivity. Let me say that again. You have to watch out that when God delivers you, he sets you free from somebody, something, who do you put in captivity? Who do you make, uh, put beneath you? So the Gibeonites come and here uh, they begin to, uh, for, for over now three, over almost 400 years, they are serving in Israel. They have to start serving the God of Israel. They are assimilated into the uh, population and eventually, for some reason, Saul gets angry with them and starts a plan, a plot to kill them and wipe them out. Now, most of us know Saul had some issues. Saul was a little crazy. We, we, we know he had an anger management problem. We know he had a self-esteem problem. He was the actual tallest man around in the country, but you know that's one of the reasons why they wanted him to be king, because he looked like a king. He looked like a king. But his heart wasn't king material. He didn't, he forgot who made him king. See, this, this is something that we have to understand. When, when we are put in a position, sometimes uh, we forget who put us in that position. And your position, write this down, write this down. Point number two, point, I, this is, I didn't, I'm, I'm skipping the point. Going to the, our position determines our perception. Our position determines our perception. And our perception determines our actions. Our position determines 
my perception. And my perception determines my actions. In other words, when, when Paul, when Saul was in a position that God had placed him in, he perceived that God had placed him there and he obeyed God. But at, for, after a while, he forgot who put him in that position and he started to think that the people put them there. And then he started to act differently. He started to act as if he had to please the people instead of pleasing God. And so when he did that, at one point, some point, God said, listen, you know what? I'm going to leave you. I'm, because you failed to obey my commandments, God leaves Saul. And the Bible says after that, an evil spirit began to oppress him. Catch this, catch this. You see, you see when, when, when God leaves you, when you disobey him and kick him out, you open a door for the enemy to come in. And if you read the scriptures in 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says that when Saul, the evil, when the spirit of the Lord left Saul, it says the Lord sent an evil spirit to oppress him. But it, it's just like if, if Elder Lee has me at his house and I leave his house and he leaves the door open and somebody else comes in and he say, Mike, you left somebody in my house. I didn't let him in the house. <laughs> he left the door open. And that's what happened with Saul. When the Lord left, the door was open for an evil spirit to come and oppress him. But catch what, what, what happens next. The Bible says that they perceived that it was an evil spirit. They didn't think, they didn't think he just needed, you know, some Tylenol. They didn't think he just needed, you know, some lithium. They didn't think he just needed, you know, some Valium. They said, wait a minute, there's a spirit oppressing you. Let's, they got a prescription. Let's call a musician. Let's get a musician to come and play anointed music and let that run the evil spirit away. Woo, wait, wait, wait. That's, this, this is a revelation. We have never seen this in scripture before. We have never seen this before. That there are, they, they saw, they perceived, everybody say perceived. perceived. They perceived that this was not just a natural problem, but there was something spiritual going on behind it. They got a revelation of what the problem was, and then they got a prescription. The prescription was to play some anointed music, and that would shift the atmosphere. And that atmosphere shift would cause the demons, which couldn't be seen, but that the demons could hear. <laughs> the demons could, everybody say the demons could hear. The demons could hear. They can't, you can't see them, but they could hear you. And the demons would hear the music, and they would be, the demons would be tormented by the anointed music. Now, Sister Paula didn't even know that I was coming this way this morning. And here she, she started saying that this morning. They, they were singing a song that said, we're going to raise a hallelujah up in here. That we're going we're to shift the atmosphere. And what happens, sometimes we need to understand that God gives the different prescription for different situations. And in this situation, he said, listen, if there is a spirit of heaviness, I can give you a garment of praise to evict the spirit of heaviness. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. He said, I got, you put on the garment of praise and that will run out the evil spirit that's trying to oppress and torment you. Because the enemy, he has a, a, a task, he's on assignment to torment us, to, to cause us to be depressed, to cause us to feel oppressed, to be overwhelmed. But there are some times where you can just put on some music. Death could not hold you down. <laughs> You are the living king. Come on, let's, let's, let's just take a moment to shift the atmosphere in here. Is that all right? Come on, let, let, let's take a moment to shift things in your home. Turn up the, your, your television. Turn up your, your device right now. We're going to worship the Lord just for a moment. Death could not hold him down. Hallelujah. He is the living king. Hallelujah. All power. See, y'all don't even want to shift the atmosphere. Y'all got, so you got comfortable where you are. You got comfortable in that position. Hallelujah, but you got to shift your position when you're going to shift the atmosphere. Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. You got to shift your position when you shift the atmosphere. Hallelujah. You have to shift your position when you shift the atmosphere. And certain music, hallelujah. Come on, turn them up a little bit. Come on, turn them up. Certain music can just shift the atmosphere. Hallelujah. And that'll run the demons off. Hallelujah. That, that'll make the enemy stop trembling because it's like, uh, like uh, uh, you, you ever been somewhere and they started scratching the, the blackboard. Y'all ever hear, ah, you can't stand it. I can't, the enemy can't stand worship. 
The enemy can't stand high praise. The Bible says, let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. Woo! Come on, give them a hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah. Shift the atmosphere in your house right now. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Glory, 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 glory. Come on, we got to shift this. We got to shift this in here. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Take your seats. Take your seats. Take your seats. We got to go. That, that's just putting the praise in the practice. Putting your praise in the practice. Here, li listen, listen. We live in two worlds, a visible and an invisible, a physical and a spiritual. And we have to be aware of what's going on in the spiritual realm. King David comes on the scene. Ah, this is some years later now, and during his reign, he, he, he sees a famine and he, he asks God, what is the problem? What has caused this? I don't know why it took David three years to ask. <laughs> and that, sometimes what happens when we, we see a problem the first year, we think, oh, this is just natural. It's all right. All right. It's the second year. Okay, I don't know. I don't, this is a little, little odd. But the third year, oh, God, you got to come do something. Lord, you got to come do something. And the Lord, we don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us how, whether a prophet came or the Lord came or showed him in the dream. But somehow he found out that the problem wasn't his problem. He didn't cause it, but now he had to deal with it. And what he had to do, the Bible says, the Lord revealed that it was because of Saul. Saul had killed the Gibeonites. So David calls the Gibeonites. He summons them and he sits down with them and says, listen, I see the Lord has revealed to me the problem is that in our nation is because of what Saul did to you and your people. He oppressed you. He had you all lynched. He had you all killed and, and took your property and took your homes and kicked you out of your territory. He, and, and, but David says, now there needs to be reconciliation. There needs to be healing. There needs to be peace because we want you to be able to bless us. We want you to be able to forgive us. So David asks them, what shall I do? Everybody say, what shall I do? What, what shall I do? See, see uh, sometimes when uh, we uh, ask someone to forgive us, we don't ask them if they do or really do forgive us. And as believers, as ministers of reconciliation, we have to not just uh, reconcile, we have to be ministers of forgiveness, and we also have to be wise in how we apologize. What, what, I, mean by, what I mean by that is uh, people have different ways or different requirements when you ask for forgiveness. People have different requirements for what they require from you in order to forgive you. I'm not sure if you, you knew this, but, but everybody don't accept your I'm sorry. Every, every, when you say I'm sorry, that, that's, that's good, but that's just a start. Uh, and there, there's a book called The Five Languages of Apology. And what it does, it, I'm telling you, it's, 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 it helps those of us who have a problem asking for forgiveness. Because some people have a problem asking for forgiveness. Some people have a problem saying I'm sorry. I know nobody in here does, but somebody online has a problem saying, <laughs> I'm sorry. But we need to learn. Everybody say, I need to learn how to say I'm sorry. Now, I, I, I want to share this because this will help you in your personal life, but also as we become ministers of reconciliation. Uh, there, there, there are five different ways that people accept your apology. Num number one is just saying, I'm sorry for. It's, number one is expressing regret. Expressing regret. That means, hey, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what? You're sorry for what? I'm sorry for knocking over that pie. <laughs> I'm sorry for 
not showing up when I said. So you're saying I'm sorry for, but never say I'm sorry but. Don't say I'm sorry but, because when you say I'm sorry but, that means you really ain't sorry. I'm sorry for hitting your car, but if you hadn't turned the way you did, I wouldn't, you just erased the I'm sorry. So I'm sorry for, everybody say I'm sorry for. Number two is accepting responsibility. Uh, the next way is to say I was wrong for hitting your car. I was wrong for not showing up. I was wrong how I said that to you. Saying I was wrong or ex taking responsibility for my actions. Number three is genuine repentance. It's not just saying I was wrong for spending too much money, but now I, I, I want to change. Help me because I have a problem with this issue. That's genuine repentance when you not only say you were wrong, not only you say you were sorry, but you genuinely want to change your behavior. I was wrong for, for getting upset in public and shouting and screaming in front of the kids. I, I, help me. I need to get some help. Okay, go get an anger management class. Come on. That's repentance. We're going we're gonna to make some effort, not just saying you were wrong, or not just apologizing, but making some effort to repent, to change your behavior. Number, I'm going to go to number five, because number five is to actually ask for forgiveness. Some people won't forgive you unless you ask them to forgive you. Unless you say, sweetheart, I'm sorry I did uh, I, I did that. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Some people are waiting for you. The, you have said something and did something, and you thought you apologized. Well, I apologize, but you didn't, ask, you, you didn't say, ask me to forgive you. They are waiting for you to say, will you forgive me? But then the last one is to take, not only taking responsibility, but to offer restitution. To offer restitution. To say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. How can I make it up to you? Now, ladies, if your husband ever asks you, how can I make it up to you? I'm sure you can come up with a way, right? right. You can figure out something he can do. <laughs> how, how can I make it up to you? The making up may be you changing your behavior. The making up may be you are going to or restricting some things in your life. The making up may be some show of repentance. Or the making up may be you got to take me out to dinner. I don't know what the making up would be. But there is a point where you have to make some sort of restitution. And all of these particular types can be seen in Scripture. We don't have the time to go through them today, but this is what David did. David said to the Gibeonites, listen, I'm sorry, we, we were wrong. What Paul did was wrong. We, we, we're not going to be running you off. I'm not going to let anybody try to kill you anymore. Nobody's going to uh, try to take your property. But here's, here, what can we do so that you will forgive us and bless us? And they said, we don't want no money. We don't want no money. See, sometimes people say, think they can just give you some money and everything will be all right. Just a, a few months ago, a so, uh, young sister, uh, Brianna Taylor, she, she's killed in her home, shot several times by the police, and their, their means of reparation, they think, is just to, hey, we're going to pay you off. How many? Here's a few million. Sounds good, but that's not justice. That didn't bring about the reparation and the healing in the family. They were trying to just do this and just give them. See, when you want to make reparations, you ask the person that you hurt, what does it take to heal them? Because David could have said, we don't know how many people, we don't know how many people Star killed. He might have killed 7,000. He might have killed 700. We don't know. And David might have thought, you know what, let's just give him some money and give him back some lamb. Maybe let's, let's just kill all of Saul's children. But he didn't know. But he asked them, what does it take to bring about reconciliation? And they said, give us seven of Saul's children. And we're going to do what he did to us. We're going to hang them. In Saul's hometown. Before, what we call it, he said, before before the Lord, the Lord chose Saul. 
Under, well, this, is, this is important because some people feel like if God chooses somebody, like everything they do is right. That ain't right. God chose Saul, but everything Saul did was not what God wanted him to do. And there are people, even in our country, <laughs> whether it's your governor, your, your mayor, or, or your president, who put, gets put in office and everything they do ain't what God told them to do. But we need leaders, and that's one of the problems right now in our country. There is a drought of leadership, of spiritual leadership that would speak truth to our leaders when they do something that's ungodly who would declare to them that what they are doing is unrighteous and they have to change their behavior. We need more people of God who will stand up on our jobs or in our position in government or wherever we may be to declare truth. Even if it means you get lose your job, even if it means you lose your position, even if it means you lose your fame. Some of our evangelists and our pastors are so uh, focused on getting notoriety that they don't speak truth to power. So here, here is what David did. David, David became a troublemaker. Everybody say troublemaker. 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 Here's the definition for a troublemaker. Here's the definition for a troublemaker. A troublemaker is someone anointed to use their gifts, their influence, and their resources to destroy the works of the devil for the glory of God. Come on, write that down, write that down. A troublemaker is someone who uses their gifts, influence, and resources to destroy the works of the devil for the glory of God. David was a troublemaker. He was one of the, he, he, he was one of the, y'all know David. David comes, he, he one of the baddest troublemakers. He come, and first thing he does, we, we see him on the scene, he comes, he's kicking demons out of Saul's house. He's playing skillfully. The, the first thing we see David doing is not killing the Goliath. The first thing we see him doing is worshiping and playing music that, that, that evicts demons. But then later we see him killing Goliath. Uh, we, we, he tells about us, him, him killing the lion and killing the bear. He, he kills Goliath. He's anointed to cause some trouble. He uses his gift of music <laughs> to run demons out. He uses his, his skillfulness uh, in a slingshot to kill Goliath. He is a troublemaker. And I just want to ask you this morning because this is the title. I skipped over the title. I want to get to it right now. The title for this sermon is, Are You a Troublemaker? Are you a troublemaker? Maker. That term may have, if some of us don't want to be trouble. I don't want to make no trouble. I don't want to cause no trouble. <laughs> but if you're here on the planet, if you're filled with the Spirit of God, you are called to be a troublemaker. Come on, just own it. Everybody say, I'm a troublemaker. Go ahead, own it. I'm a troublemaker. I'm a troublemaker. So David makes some trouble for the house of Saul. He goes to Saul's family and gets seven of their children. He doesn't take Mephibosheth. <laughs> if y'all know, y'all read the rest of the story. He doesn't take Mephibosheth, which he keeps because Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son. He's had a covenant with, with him. But he takes seven of Saul's grandsons and sons, and he has them hanged. He doesn't have them hanged. The Gibeonites hanged them. And then the Lord's, the rest of the scripture says that God heard them and he healed the land. What they did brought peace. But why was David willing to do that? It's because David had been in a position where he himself, like the Gibeonites, had been hunted by Saul. See, his position gave him a different perspective. His position allowed him to see what they had been through and it made him willing to act and do what they asked him to do. Your position affects your perception. If you've never been in a situation where you needed food or, or you, you out of employment, you don't know what it feels like when somebody doesn't have food or doesn't, uh, have, doesn't have a job. So sometimes we might be as, as sensitive or as compassionate because we haven't been in that position. But when you have been in position where other people have been, then you can see through their eyes and we act differently because we have been in that position. But here's what God tells us. He, he says, now because we are born again, he's made us sit in heavenly places. 
That's what the song was talking about. We, he's seated in heavenly places. But he said he made us sit in heavenly places also. So now you are in a whole nother position. We don't see life through just the lens of our flesh, through just the lens of our culture, through just the lens of our race or our neighborhood or the, who we, the hood we grew up in. We don't just see through that lens. Now he has lifted us above that so that we can see from a heavenly perspective, so that we can judge righteously. One of the first places where blindness is mentioned in the Bible because we can't judge right if we don't see right. And one of the first places blindness is mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Exodus. Let's go there right quick. Quickly, the book of Exodus, chapter number 23, uh, verse 8. Chapter 23, verse 8. And it says this, you shall take no bribe. For a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. One of the first places that blindness is mentioned in the Bible doesn't have to do with natural blindness but social blindness. It has to do with how money can affect your vision to see things and how you treat people. That how I see you affects how I treat you. But how I treat you affects how God treats me. Oh, you, you, let, let me remind you, this is what Jesus said, what you've done unto the least of these You've done it unto me. So how I treat you affects how God treats me. And if everybody believed that, <laughs> if people really believed that how we treat one another, how we love our neighbor, that our salvation, as Pastor said, is not just vertical, but it's horizontal. If we really believe that, we would love and treat one another much better than we do. But most of us believe that I can treat you however I want to treat you. You don't mean nothing to me. I'm tired of you. Forget them. I ain't think about them. <laughs> Some people, uh, we would say the other night, oh, I can love them from a distance. God don't want you to love them from a distance. He says, he says, draw near unto me. He wants us to love each other. See, love is action. Love takes action. Love is an action verb. So me talking about I love you from a distance, that just means I'm not mistreating you because you're not nice near to me. <laughs> If you weren't close to me, I wouldn't really be loving on you. <laughs> but if we love our neighbor, as you said, as ourself, we become troublemakers because everybody can't do that. Everybody won't do that. I'm not going to say everybody can't, but everybody won't do that. Everybody say, I'm a troublemaker. I'm a troublemaker. Turn to the book of Acts chapter number 16. We have to go. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And I'm going to quote a scripture in Acts 10. You don't have to go there. We're going to go to Acts 16. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Jesus delivered those, healed those who were oppressed by the devil. Not just, we see what David did on a national level. Now, Jesus did things on a personal level. And this is what we're going to go to another, another account in Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas, they are going to prayer and they get harassed by a young lady who is tormented by a demon. So there is some personal harassment, some personal oppression going on here. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, it says, Now it happened. As we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did many days, but Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he did. He came out that very hour. But, everybody say but. But when her masters saw that she was delivered, saw that they were, she, when their masters saw that she was set free, when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, 
they started beating Paul and Silas up. They, <laughs> they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. They brought them to the magistrates and said what? Everybody read that. These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. Paul and Silas were troublemakers. Young lady starts screaming at them. And, and what she said was nice. It was right, but it was how she was saying it. She was being sarcastic. She was tormenting. They came to teach you how to be saved. They want to show you how to be saved. <laughs> Y'all ever saw that movie? I can't even remember what it said. Marcus. <laughs> some, people, some people's voice just irritates you. <laughs> and she was irritating them. But Paul knew it was not her, but it was a demon, a demonic spirit. So here comes Paul. He says, I'm going to set you free today. I'm going to deliver you today. I'm going to set you free. So he prays and casts the demon out. But the people who were making profit off of her captivity says, you a troublemaker. They had Paul and Silas put in prison. They had them beat. They had them tortured. So I, I want you to, to know something today. Listen, listen, that when you start to exercise your anointing and become a troublemaker, everybody's not going to be happy about you setting the captives free. <laughs> everybody's not going to be excited about you delivering people. Everybody's not going to be excited about you making changes on how they do procedures. Everybody's not going to be happy about that. The devil's not going to roll out a red carpet and say, come on in and just have your way. It's all right. Just come on. In. No, no. He's going to resist you. He's going to fight you. He's going to come against you. And as believers, we have to expect the opposition but not give in to it. As believers, we have to expect that the enemy <laughs> is going to come and, and accuse us wrongfully, but we can't give in to that. Here, here's the, I want you to write this down. Write this truth down. We must never forsake our assignment because of the persecution we receive for our obedience. Write that down, write that down. We, we must never forsake our assignment because of the persecution we receive for our obedience. The enemy is going to attack you. And when you, we start attacking institutions that elevate some uh, but uh, emasculate others, when we uh, attack uh, practices which promote some uh, but uh, imprison others, when we put up people and, and see and discard guts and tell people their problems when they begin to lift up some but then push down others, when we begin to speak truth to power, power is going to push back. But we have to be confident and not shrivel up. We have to stand in the face of adversity. Come on, any, anybody willing to make some trouble in here? Do I, do I have any trouble? Are there any troublemakers in, in the house? Are, are there any troublemakers online? If you're a troublemaker, just write it in all caps. I'm a troublemaker. I'm a troublemaker. I'm willing to make trouble for the kingdom of God. It's not for my glory. It's not for your glory. It's for the glory of God that he's empowered us and given us ability and capacity. He's given us gifts. He's put you in position so you can make trouble. And Christians have been making trouble for centuries. I said, Christians have been making troubles for centuries. <laughs> the, the, the first hospital was started by a Christian. He made some trouble and got the, the, the prominent people in uh, the community to begin to give so that he could help heal people. The, the right to vote for women start, was started by Christian women uh, so that they could have, they saw the oppression of women and they wanted to liberate them. The civil rights movement was started by Christians, by believers who said, and, and Dr. Martin Luther King, who said, listen, we have to have change. So we're going to make some trouble. Pastor, there's a pastor by the name of Robert Gratz, great, uh, who was a Lutheran pastor in Mobile, Alabama, a white brother who, who saw the anguish and the oppression of uh, the black brothers and sisters in that city, and he started making trouble. When they did the boycott, he said, you know what, I'm going to drive y'all around. Y'all get in my car, I'll drive you around. And for that whole year or so, he drove people around, chauffeured them to their jobs. But you know, there were some people who hated him just for giving other people a ride. <laughs> people will mistreat you. People will abuse you. There's a sister by the name of J Jane Elliott 
who in 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, she made some trouble. And in her third grade class, she did an experiment, the blue-eyed, brown-eyed experiment. And if you've read on any of this or go on YouTube where you can see this, she began to teach the young people. You said, if you have blue eyes, you're better than the people with brown eyes. And as she showed, she did this for a day. And everybody with the blue eyes felt like, oh, they were so great. But the next day she came and said, you know what? I was wrong. The people with brown eyes are better than the people with blue eyes. Mm -hmm. But this was in Iowa in 1968 in an all-Caucasian European white class. And she's teaching them, she's trying to teach them that your skin color doesn't matter. So what she did was she taught them that your eye color doesn't matter. And that caused some trouble. I said that caused her some trouble. That caused people in her community to hate her, to call her and give her death threats. But how could she submit their children to this torment for one day? Everybody say, I'm a troublemaker. There are troublemakers in this church. I believe that. Are any, any troublemakers in the church? <laughs> People who are willing to make a difference in your community, who are willing to stand up uh, to unlawful and unrighteous practices. Even lawful, they may be lawful, but they're ungodly. There are people right here who are willing to do that. Amen. And I'm just going to pray for you right now. Hallelujah. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that we don't faint in the day of adversity. I want to pray for you that you don't give up when the enemy <laughs> comes in like a flood. <laughs> I, don't, I want to pray for you that you don't faint uh, when, when people start talking about you and saying who they think you, they are. Who they think. I'm a child of God. <laughs> I think I'm just doing the work of the Lord. If you, if you have been or feel that you are called to be a troublemaker, would you stand up, even in your house, even in your house, wherever you are, if you feel you're called to be a troublemaker? How many of you are ready to make some trouble? Are you ready? You ready to, come on, come on. Are you, are you ready to make some trouble? I can't hear you. Y'all, see that, see that? I don't feel like I can go to battle with y'all. I don't, I don't feel that intenseness that you're willing to go to battle. <laughs> lift, lift your hands. Lift your hands right now. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you right now for these troublemakers. Glory. 